We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode um, of the Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors with Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And in this episode, we're going to be looking at working with loneliness as a clinical condition. Yes. I won't give a parallel on football matches because I'll probably frustrate you. <laughs> I'm sitting here alone talking to you. So I feel there's a connection. I feel though we're on Zoom, uh, yeah, I don't feel loneliness, lone, sense of loneliness at all. But I want to make a, a um, separation between the terms alone and loneliness are two different things uh, you can be you can be alone in you can feel alone in um well, you know where there's thousands of people you can still feel alone absolutely does mean, yeah yeah does it mean you feel lonely it's another story but if we talk about loneliness we must talk about in the terms of mental health um which is what really this podcast is about so when I do assessments at the Institute uh, and I pass them on to therapists, I have half an hour. And one of the really important questions I ask is always in terms of, do you live alone? Yeah. What's your support mechanisms? Yeah. When people feel a de desperate sense of loneliness, that could often lead to depression, lack of self-esteem, anxiousness. And from there, often acute withdrawal. Yeah. I look for a definition of loneliness, by the way. So I just put loneliness into Google. Okay. And it says the definition of loneliness that we use, this is a, uh, the website they've gone to, is called Better Help. Better Health, I think. Um, loneliness is a subjective, that means it's unique to ourselves, right? comma, unwelcome feeling of lack or loss of companionship. And that means the other. Yeah. And you can feel, as I said, it's really important, this is, because when people feel their, their, their loneliness, which they may feel is just subjective to them, uh, I should think from that often becomes mental health problems or may do. Yeah. So that is why you hear many, in many adverts or many pleas or many, especially at Christmas, go and check your neighbours out. Absolutely. You live by yourself. Yeah. Live by themselves, I mean. Because loneliness will lead or can lead um, to a very unwelcome state. Yeah. And I, I agree what you said, you know, at the beginning of this, that you can you can feel alone in a room full of people. <laughs> and uh, as soon as you said that, for me, it, it kind of, there was something about a sense of belonging oh. Oh. That we need to feel like we belong somewhere, or we have a purpose, or something along those lines, in order to feel like we're not alone. Yeah, and and you know, it's loneliness is an is a internal state. Yeah, I say do yeah, I I live alone, but you know, I have many friends. I get out. I can do this. I do that. I have a very structured life. And even though they live alone or they have a, a lone, solitary life, they may report to you, but they don't actually feel lonely. Mm. So when I'm talking about loneliness, I'm talking about the internal state of loneliness, which is usually a very 
deep feeling of being cut off from the other. Yeah. I think about despair as well when you think about yeah. loneliness. I, I think yes. of, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, and no hope and, and all those sort of negative things. Yeah. If you think of it as a clinical condition. Yeah. Yeah. Then that is, I think, an important. You see, it's not in the DSM for the Diagnostic Statistical Manual as a mental health condition, but I see it as a mental health condition because of what it can lead to. Yeah. If somebody feels internally lonely, they often cut themselves off from society. They have, then have to rely on only validation from themselves. Um, they're insular. Their reality yeah. is very narrow. The world becomes smaller and smaller. In fact, they could lose touch with reality. Yeah. And it's a dire sparing state to be in yeah it, it, if to see somebody you know suffering from extreme loneliness i would imagine is, is quite rare in a therapy room because for them to reach out to a therapist is that something that you would do if you were in that you know state it's an interesting question that is um <clears throat> People can come to therapy because they feel they're not in touch with reality, or they may come to therapy before because they feel cut off from all of the world, or they might come to therapy because they know something is wrong, or they might come to therapy because they just know that without social contact of some sort, they get depressed or whatever it is. Yeah. Or might come to therapy when they feel depressed and down they might come to therapy when they feel anxious and as you go down the layers of the anxiousness or the depression or the lack of self-esteem you may come across an extreme sense of loneliness so what would you do in the therapy process what would you do in the therapy room then you mentioned self-esteem then w would you kind of work on on that side of things well my first step i think would be to do what they call in ta script analysis in other words in other language i'd want to know their story yeah. yeah now in them telling me their story i would ask practical questions which is do you actually live with any yeah any supports do you have any resources so I, I do the, I'd be setting out practical stuff, listen to their story. And also I wouldn't right away go down the layers and look at the developmental self, but I'd be thinking about when in their history have they felt so desperately alone, stroke, lonely. So th is this a client who comes with ex such extreme neglect that they are so cut off from the world that they feel utter despair and desolation that coming to therapy is their last hope? And from that position, I know what I know what we're working. The first step is to learn their story. Yeah. Second step will be to get the contract what they want. Now it might take a might take a very long time to get that, but um, the third step is to really find out the origins of the desolation and loneliness before we go anywhere else. Yeah. Because the practical side of things, do you know what I mean, it, are quite important. You know, you touched on a few there, but it's like lack of social skills can, do you know what I mean? If if we can't pass time with people and connect with people, that can, you know, lead to us being lonely. You know, so it's about how far do we go in the therapy room modelling things? You know, if they're an introvert 
all that sort of stuff. Or personality types can have an impact on us and whether we connect with people and build relationships appropriately and all this sort of stuff. So there's a, there's an awful lot of stuff there, isn't there? Yes, we haven't even touched about the other side of the consumer, and that's neurodiversity. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Where they are kind of cut off and separate and, yeah. Lack empathy, perhaps, lack yeah. more than black and white, have problems in social relationships and um, understanding social cues. Yeah, yeah. They're isolated, I feel, um, different from the world. yeah. Now, now that may not be at the same continuum, but it's a very important continuum to look at. Absolutely. Because of what decisions they may have made about themselves and other people from that. Yeah. So there's a whole world of neurodiversity to, to really um, know about. And that's why I said we need to know their story first before we make any clinical contracts. Yeah. And, you know, do you think society plays a part in this as well now, you know, compared to how it used to be in the good old days? I was having this conversation with somebody. I can't remember who it was. But, you know, in the olden days, therapy used to take place over the garden wall. You know, we would talk to our neighbours and I've got an old bloke that lives next door to me and he often just sits on the bench outside the front of his house and we have a chat when I'm walking past and things. But it's the older generation that tends to do that. A lot of the younger generations, they haven't got a clue who lives next door to them or anything. But they do have a clue. Well, yeah, maybe they do and they avoid no, them. No, no, no. no. I was thinking in terms of social media. Yeah. Instagram, uh, all the TikTok, um, all these sorts of things. The most lonely people are often people who are so immersed in the world of social media. Yeah. And the, the pandemic, do you know what I mean? That's not helped us with how we interact with people. You know, I've, I've got clients even now that, you know, when we came out of lockdown, really struggled to to reconnect with people again after so long. And, you know, if they were sheltering for health reasons and things like that. Yeah, there's all those sorts of things. However, somebody who's suffering from extreme loneliness, after you've discovered their story, the end goal in many ways, well, not the end goal, sorry, not the end goal at all, sorry, a goal on the way is around contact with you. The therapist in other words yeah because in the end you need to work towards them connecting with other people first step usually is they have to connect with themselves but you can help them do that second step then is how they can connect to other people but they yeah. have to first of all connect with themselves to be aware of how to connect with other people Yeah. And again, that can be a slow process. Yeah, yeah, it can. And on the way, <clears throat> as they start to learn about themselves and learn to be aware of internal and external connections, you might give them some, I won't say homework, but some ideas. So, for example, well, you know, if you tell me about your structure of the day and they tell you, and you realise in the structure of the day, they don't actually meet anyone. Mm. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a piece of homework I'd like you to do. Um, how about you just go out of your way to look at what sort of people you'd like to meet or if there's any groups in your, you know, whatever it is, but it's yeah. just around fostering external connection. Yeah. But before you get there, you need to find out you know, around the in, the lack of the internal connection with the self. But on the way, you will then work towards the making connection in some way with the outside world, whatever. Yeah. That. yeah, I think I would do that, you know, and model it and practice it in the therapy room as well. I can remember a long, long time ago having a client who 
found it really difficult to just pass time. And I think it was one of the first times I'd ever come across. My mum had a hairdressing salon when I was growing up and then she had a dress shop with me nana and I kind of grew up in that environment. So it was really easy for me to talk to people who I'd never met before and to just pass the time with people. I, I thought everybody could do it <laughs> until I met this client who really struggled to just have a conversation with somebody at a bus stop for no apparent reason. Yeah, usually people who are extremely lonely feel they're social misfits. Yeah. Or they feel they're eccentric or they feel there's something wrong with them. So from that position, it's so hard, isn't it? Yeah. For them. Yeah. But first of all, I realize actually they may feel they're a social misfit or they may feel they're eccentric. Let's look at where they come from and how you do all that work. So that so they can get to a place perhaps they may dare to believe they're not those things. And then maybe how we can connect with others. Yeah. And that, you know, I think I would probably look at, you know, doing some work around their self-worth as well. Do you know what I mean? And what they've got to offer in a relationship with somebody and, you, you know, that it's a two-way street when we do make a connection with somebody. And what do you mean by a two-way street? Well, it's it's not about just what we can offer them. It's about what they can offer us as well. It, it's like both ways, you know, and that, yeah. I sometimes get the impression with some people that it's what the other, what they can get from the other person a lot of the time, and they don't really think about what they can give as well, what said, their worth is to the other person. You could not have sent. You could not have said a truer word. But in terms of the treatment of loneliness, before you know, besides finding out their unique story, you need to find out first how they've lost connection with their self. Because unless, unless you go there first, it's very hard to get to that yeah. two-way street you're talking about. So how do we do that then? Well, first of all, I'd be looking at where in your life, in your earlier life, have you felt this extreme loneliness? And what are the feelings that come with that? You know, um, that's where I'd go first. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I might not say it in those words, but I probably would. Where in your life have you felt these familiar feelings? And when in your life did you make the decision that there was something wrong with you? So, again, I'm working developmentally again all the time. I yeah. always go back there. I know there yeah. are other ways to work, but. In terms of this podcast, you've got a therapist, i.e. me here, who will always work that way. Because I believe that the past affects the present. Absolutely. So we, get, so we can get the healing in the past. How can the present be different? Yeah. Well, how can it be different? Because we're always, we're always going to repeat our past. Yeah. I yeah I I I a hundred percent agree. I don't think I work that way as much as what you do. I think I I go there every now and then, but not intentionally. If that makes sense. No, you can work another way. You can yeah. You can work behaviorally. You can really you know. You could set these people new behaviors to do. Um, you could. Uh, change them help their thinking about themselves you know you could do all those sorts of things you could put different resources in for them etc etc so there are different ways but for me unless we go back to where all this began and i don't get this wrong for people who are listening in i think a lot of the other things become plasters yeah i i do agree with that yeah and I don't want to discount anybody listening or works in a different way at all. It, yeah. it, it simply 
my professional training in the way that I think and the 40 years of working that way. Yeah, I think I'd like to think that I do a bit of both. I do a bit of the deeper stuff, but then, you know, I also do some practical educative yeah, but that sort the, of stuff it, as well. It comes first. Because um, if you do the developmental stuff, you can then put in the other stuff you're talking about. If you do it the other way round and do the behavioural, cognitive stuff first, I think you're going down a different road. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, yeah, I agree. But, but I think sometimes it depends on the client and... Oh, where oh. they are it's like I'm thinking particularly I've, I've been working with a, a young person and it's very very difficult with them so we do do a lot of practical things in the session how old is this um she's I, I don't want to give out too much away but yeah hey, are you seven... talking about are you talking about an adolescent yes right now if we're talking about adolescents I think there's different ways of working with adolescents so I, I really can understand what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, and she, you know, they are a bit of an introvert, so they, I I don't want them to feel like they're under the spotlight a lot of the time, so we do do a lot of practical... There's a whole different way of working with child, children and adolescents to the way that I'm talking about, which is working with adults. Yeah, yeah. I think it's two different ways, different processes here. And... At the same time, uh, when you're working with adults and where I work with the adults, you will work with their younger selves. Mm. Transactionalysis is a marvellous model uh, in thinking about how to work with the younger self in the child ego state. And transactionalysis is trained a very much so in developmental ways. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's why I like it, you, you know, because there, there are so many different, you know, me and my diagrams and, you know, all those sorts of things. I do find it, I I do like it. There's always something that you can look at on, on working with clients, whether that's script analysis or the OK Corral or whatever it is. There's, there's always a way somewhere yeah definitely now i said the first thing really after meeting somebody who has a profile of loneliness um in the clinical room is to get to know their story yeah and usually for somebody who reports extreme loneliness you might be the only person they've seen that week so coming with that, it's really important to think the next bit, which is around overwhelming them. Mm. Because if you go gung-ho into extreme, I don't know, validation or whatever it is, they can feel so overwhelmed, they'll never come back. Yeah. Most people are extremely lonely. You are often the first, you know, the person I see and often they will report it was it took all my strength to get through the week you know when i came back from the therapy session because i'm not used to that level of contact yeah yeah and it can be overwhelming well it will be yeah but people haven't had it yeah and that's important to remember i think yeah Yeah. Loneliness is a, is a clinical condition, and especially what it can lead to, which is depression, can lead to depression, self-loathing, self-hatred, feeling worthless, feeling of social, mis, you know, mis, uh, out of touch with society, all the things we're talking about. So it's very important. And sometimes, you know, in a therapy, work with clients you'll go down the layers and come to the lonely self which has been covered up through very strong adaptations and defense systems but underneath it all 
they feel something's really wrong with them and an outcast and then you hear about the loneliness and the word you used desolation yeah yeah as you were saying that then i was thinking you know we we i don't want to say every mental health issue or not but you know loneliness must play a part in in a lot of it because we do disconnect from from people you know when we are anxious or depressed or you know ill or anything like that you know if we social anxiety whatever it is we do disconnect so that there's going to be loneliness peppered in a lot of mental health conditions yeah and it's really important for therapists to realize that putting them in a group or overwhelming them with validation is completely the wrong way to work mm. you need to find out you need to hear their story and find out how come they have become that way and help them understand the disconnection and find out what the context was in their lives when they decided to disconnect in such an extreme way. Yeah. Oh, I'm not really lonely. I've got plenty of friends somewhere. Oh, how many friends you've got? Well, um, well, I haven't seen them for a while. Um, so you said so then the therapist said, well, when did you last see them? Well, maybe three or four months ago. But you see the minimization, the moving away from the other, what might feel often intrusion. Yeah. There's something as well about, you know, I'll speak to clients sometimes and <clears throat> it's like, is there a benchmark for for being sociable and how many friends and how many acquaintances is the average person's? Because, you know, when I talk to clients, I think they're quite shocked at the amount of friends that I say I have because I think they think that you should have more. I've got a lot of acquaintances but friends, you know, true friends that I know I could pick up the phone and they're there for me. I can probably count on one hand. I found I listened to a very sad story. I was listening to um, people who, who came up Love Island. They've been on Love Island, that reality TV program. Yeah. I was looking at, well, what, you know, why people went on, don't they gain out of it? Because 10% of the relationships don't last. That they make in Love Island. <clears throat> and all the things from that. And one of the people was saying that because they hadn't got 10,000 likes or something more than that, when they came out of Love Island, they saw themselves as a failure. And it made me think about how many people base their <clears throat> sense of connection on the likes mm. they give given to their Facebook or Instagram pages. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah yeah and like it's, it's just you know one of the things that kind of goes through my mind i must google what is the average amount of friends we should have for to be a healthy all well-rounded person and i bet it's not as many as what people think it is <laughs> not at all but you know the most important friend is yourself yes that's where you stem from really and that's what i'm saying people who suffer from this clinical condition of loneliness they've cut off from themselves. So they've not even got a narrative in their head, which is particularly friendly. Mm. But they've lost that part of themselves. Yeah. And it's a big thing for people to be alone with themselves. <laughs> you, you know, a lot of the time clients will say to me, I'm okay until I stop and then you know, the thoughts and the, the overthinking. So they're just busy and doing things all the time. To just sit and be with your own thoughts is quite difficult for a lot of people. Absolutely right. And we haven't even touched on the somatic considerations of loneliness. In other words, a lack of eating. Mm, yeah. You know, um, headaches, uh, extreme weight loss. Many of the... Um, consequences of loneliness are played out in the body as well because the body becomes impoverished 
Yeah, that's really sad. I hope doctors are taught about some of these things because when somebody goes to see them with extreme weight loss or they come go to see them with you know, uh, headaches or, or whatever we're talking we're just talking about here, I think the doctor needs to think about social contact. Mm. If you live by yourself or what's and hopefully the the doctor will start to ask these basic questions because the somatic considerations of loneliness is played out in the physical sense as well as the emotional sense. Yeah. Yeah, when you were saying that, then I was thinking about a lot of elderly people. It's quite apparent when you're saying that, do you know what I mean? That a lot of that somatic, you know, could be down to loneliness when, yeah. Often is. Yeah. Yeah. Is. And I don't think it's, it's we, we pay attention to it. No, and I think society, unfortunately, isn't, isn't either particularly. They don't, you know, we, we've moved away from uh, the time when we had extended families and all the things you talked about, you know, like uh, popping down the garden and speaking to the people next door or, or being extended families and all these sorts of things. I know you can feel alone and alone and alone again in extended family situations but we've moved away in the western world to a more nuclear family mm. situation where those type of extended families and everything that goes with that has got lost yeah i think doctors and, and you you know they've started doing something called social prescriptions now aren't they where you know they have somebody that can prescribe social things to them like going for a walk with nature or you know, joining a gym and all these sort of things, instead of it being, you know, medicine subscription prescriptions, they're looking at more, you know, mindfulness and all those sort of things. All things. And also, if the person has lost connection with themselves, um, these sorts of prescriptions can unfortunately be overwhelming. Mm. Yeah. I've enjoyed this podcast, Bob. It's been a, I think it's a, we haven't even got on to existential loneliness, but I haven't got time about that. But the person feels that so to their core, a sense of being wrong in society or a miscast or centric, whatever we talk about, um, will lead often to mental health Mm. so it's a very serious podcast i think for this yeah i mean i know yeah. a lot of the stuff we talk about are very serious but i think loneliness leads or can lead to many of the mental health issues that we're talking about today and i think it needs people well, i'd like society to think more about people uh who live alone perhaps yeah. don't have contact with people who you just see, like the person you mentioned, which I thought was very kind of you, when you, you talk about the person who's, I don't know if it's next door to you, that sits on the bench uh, on the front of his house. And then when you go by, you have a conversation. Yeah, absolutely. It might, only, it might be the only conversation yeah. I have all of that day until you arrive the next day and they continue the conversation. Yeah. But it used to, when I was growing up, it used to be a regular thing where you'd see people sitting outside the front of the houses or whatever, you know, somebody, I don't know, cleaning the windows and you'd stop and have a chat with them and things. We we don't tend to do that as much now. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's an important podcast. and Absolutely. I think it's definitely one worth doing. Oh. Okie dokie. What's the next podcast then? The next one I've got is running therapy groups. Oh, we're going to talk about how <laughs> how how we run them. How do we decide uh, when to to run individual therapy groups? Uh, yeah, that, that's the great subject. Of course, I was a group therapist for most of my life, so that'll be an interesting. I'm, I'm looking for. I know I say I'm look forward to each and every one of them, Bob, but I am because I've never done group therapy. I've been 
in group therapy personally myself, but I've never run a therapy group. So I will be taking notes on this. Great. So look forward to uh, speaking next week then. Okie doke. I shall speak to you very soon. You will. Take care. Bye. 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 You've been listening to The Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.